Here's the ultimate question. How do you get a person to do the right thing at three o'clock in the morning when nobody else is watching? And the answer to that is, they're only gonna do it if they want to. That's really the nucleus or the core of what makes practicing perfection so successful. People think they can motivate other human beings to do things, and you can't. All motivation is internal. Now, we can inspire people, and we can force people, but you can't motivate people. Companies hire us to help them reduce human error. We were able to reduce our human performance errors that led to events to zero for a number of years. What they get is they get culture change. The whole thing's about changing the culture. I've learned a lot, meaning I can adapt that to where I work and also to uh, my home life. When you put this stuff in place, organizations cannot help but to be safe because we're changing behaviors. And when we do that, we're saving people's lives. You are a leader and you are influencing others by your actions and your words and the, th the things that you say and do. And somebody pointed that out to him and he never even really thought of himself that way. And now he's out there influencing people as much as he possibly can. That's what peer leadership is all about. When I was about 10 years old, I knew that what I wanted to be when I grew up was a motivational speaker and writer. And for whatever reason, I've always had an acute high level of interest in I guess for lack of a better term, behavioral psychology. It's the why we do what we do and how people respond in situations has always been just fascinating to me for whatever reason. If by all my efforts I could make an honest, positive improvement in at least one other person's life, then it was all worthwhile. So I read Think and Grow Rich for the first time by Napoleon Hill when I was 10 years old. I was absolutely fascinated by that book. So the next thing I did was I picked up How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie which I read about six times, and this stuff just absolutely turned me on. Now, I'm 10 years old, which is really bizarre. Coming out of high school, I have this business with two full-time employees, five part-time employees. I'm burning and churning. I'm gonna be one of those kid millionaires the whole bit, right? But I plowed every penny that was coming in right back into the business with no reserve, didn't really know what I was doing. Wasn't um, smart enough to ask anybody for help. I'm a 19-year-old kid living in the most expensive apartment complex in town, brand new truck. My money's just drying up, right? So I thought, you know, the Navy seemed pretty cool. I'm gonna go down and talk to the Navy recruiter. So when I went down to the Navy recruiter and told him what kind of grades I got in school and everything, which were really good, he said, I wanna tell you about the nuclear power program because they were getting, Recruiters were getting extra points for recruiting nukes, as they call them. So I was down that afternoon taking the qualification test for that. And then 11 days later, I'm in boot camp in San Diego, California. Literally ran away from everything and joined the Navy. I was on a, uh, a missile submarine which goes out for three months and goes around in circles and come back. I was on the first Trident submarine, the USS Ohio. There's no contact with the outside world. There's some incoming information, but you can't at least back then, you couldn't communicate with anybody at home or anything. That was a phenomenal laboratory to study human behavior. So th that really piqued my interest because what you had there was you had um, about 160 people from all different walks of life captivated in this confined environment facing the same set of conditions and circumstances and stimulations day in and day out and observing how different people responded to the exact same conditions really helped strengthen my, not only my interest, but my awareness of human behavior and how things work. I come out of the Navy and then I end up getting my senior reactor operator certification, doing a bunch of training and all that sort of stuff. And then I, I ended up with a 20-year career in the commercial nuclear power industry, essentially. So here I am now, I'm about 18 years into my career, and I'm at a, a nuclear power plant with a site population of about 700 people. We had this meeting, and the objective of the meeting was you know, our human error rates and human performance is about average for the commercial nuclear power industry. But we know, we know based on the, the staff and the, and the people that we have, we can do a whole lot better. In that meeting, I said, you know what? I've got some ideas on how to approach this differently. They were open to hearing what I had to say. And uh, at the end of the meeting, they just said, go do it.
Basically, they gave me the ball and let me run with it. Fortunately, all the ideas that I put together and the way we implemented them with total support from senior leadership, we, we achieved phenomenal results. As a matter of fact, the results were so phenomenal. Over about a 30-month period, we achieved an 87.5% reduction in the human error rate at that station. And that's not fixing something that was broken. That was going from average to exceptional. For those of you who've been through any length of training, when I'm training, and I'm sure everybody else says this as well, everything in this approach is win-win. If it's not, we don't do it. So combining all of my lifelong learning with all the experiences that I had, I put together some ideas on how to approach human performance differently. People who teach culture change are still standing up behind the podium saying, culture change is hard and it takes a long time. And I absolutely 100% disagree with that because we've proven it over and over and over. Culture's made of behaviors. And whether you're talking about a street gang or a church choir, they've all got a culture and it rewards certain things and it punishes certain things. Most of the mistakes, eight, nine out of 10 mistakes that you experience in your organization are due to problems with your system. A lot of morale issues, trust issues between the workforce and the management. In the old style world, it's, it's top down management. You try to drive culture change from the top down. So it's sort of like you have a box in the middle of the floor, you walk around that box for years rather than move it out of the way. Uh, I've even heard it say, you know, you don't want people to think, you just do what you're told. And that's, in today's world, you, I don't think you survive that way. Changing the culture of a 500 person or 1,000 person organization. It's like you have an aircraft carrier and you want to make a 90 degree turn to either port or starboard. That ship has to travel over two nautical miles to negotiate that turn. So then what we have to do is compare that to how long does it take to make a 90 degree turn if you're in a speedboat. Well, you can negotiate a 90 degree turn in a speedboat almost instantaneously. The idea is we transform the organization from being an aircraft carrier and oil tanker into a fleet of speedboats. Now think about that in the context of your organizations where we're out there policing, we're looking for people doing things wrong, we're gonna put a letter in their file, the first time they've been a 10 year employee, never screwed up, first time they screw up, we gotta to go to that level one discipline or whatever the heck we call it. So instead of focusing and punishing individuals when they make mistakes, let's work to find what we call landmines. They're, they're just things that have laid out there for years and years that no one's ever dealt with. You focus on the positive, you have a toddler, and they're just learning how to walk. You don't e expect them to walk perfectly when they first start to walk, right? You expect them to fall, you expect things to happen. So what do you do when they start taking those first few steps? You're like, yay, that's wonderful. You don't say, oh, look, you fell after two steps. The, 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 the ticket then is to take the stuff that really works and present it in a way that first of all grabs their attention clearly indicates what's in it for them, make it fast, simple, and easy, and then they want to do it. And that's how you change behaviors. The PPI the material is very comprehensive. It uh, laces human behavior, psychology, uh, together with human performance improvement processes, human error reduction techniques, uh, wraps them all up in one package. Yeah, I've worked with the concept of human performance and many of the things that uh, Tim and PPI teach. Uh, for a couple of decades now, so for a long time and pretty familiar with the processes. Once you get going, identify the champions as soon as you can. It's not magic, it takes work, it takes focus, and, and definitely belief. You gotta know, you gotta know it and believe it. The best part about this approach that we call practicing perfection is anybody can implement it. And they gave this back. Then we went back to our group, then we worked with our, our employees. But guess who I left out? When you're trying to do this process, are you telling me that the landmines that were out there, and, and you know, the story I told about my friend that got killed, we founded the Practicing Perfection Institute in, in 2005 because the idea was I'm going to take what we learned and make it available to the rest of the world. We implemented at our plant first at Limestone. First, we were a pilot program for them. You know, Limestone is one of our flagship success stories. And we, we came in, the employees came in, we got the training, and uh, we liked what we heard. And being union-based the way we are, you know, we, we liked it, we saw it, we said, we can do this. 
And I'm like, all right, do what? You know, we haven't even talked about what implementation is or anything else. We've just covered the concepts. It was in 2009, we'd actually had seven uh, accidents at our plant. We had 260 NRG employees and we had a, about a two hour phone call with Tim Autry and tried to understand what the process was and the, and really took a leap of faith and we trained all of our employees, all 260 employees. I've been with the company for, for 35 years and it was, it was the biggest, fastest culture change that I've, I've ever experienced. Surprisingly, the, uh, the union employees brought it to management. Uh, none of us understood it. None of us had any idea of what uh, consequences would be, uh, how, how life-changing it would be. We went 522 days without a recordable accident. It's uh, 750,000 hours, almost a, almost a million hours. That's, that's a record for our plant. When we do it this way, who wins in this scenario? We all win. We all win. Recognize what we needed to do was create uh, experts in this that could then go out, multipliers basically is what we're looking at. So. From the very beginning, we had a certification course with our, with our first client, and we did the three people in-house. Our first class was three students and me, and we went through all the materials, and I went through all the underlying psychology. I was the very first person certified for Practicing Perfection back in 2006. I'm officially certificate number two. The position of where we sat in the room was dictating cert number one and cert number two. So Alan Reed was um, fortunate enough to sit in the right spot. He said the other day, um, he said it's up for sale if you'd like to purchase certificate number one. We had our first um, uh, public certification course about, mm, I don't know, 10 months after that. And then we've had several of them. So we have, uh, this year we'll be beyond 200 people certified in this approach called Practicing Perfection. Tim has a true passion to save lives and ultimately eliminate the potential for mistakes and errors in organizations. And as a result, that is a reflection on all of us as facilitators to do the same thing. I honestly believe that one of the most fundamental things of being human is we all want to matter. We want to make a difference. And what happens is human beings come in to work inside of an organization and they get that job and they're excited about it and they honestly think they can make a difference inside of that company. And our systems and our structures and our policies and everything else, generically speaking, shut that down dramatically well. I mean, just, we shut that down beautifully. Look, you work for me, I'm the boss, do this because I said so. <laughs> Immediate resistance. So what we figured out how to do is to combine some very simple fundamental elements relative to human error reduction, if we're talking about that specifically, but then layer them in with a psychology that comes from inside and helps individuals expand their context. So they're thinking about things differently and then everything is presented from the perspective of what's in it for them. I know that we have something, especially when you come to them and say, look, we understand that you come to work wanting to do a good job and we understand that you're the one that have the answers for, the, for your organization's problems. When I, when I come to an organization and say that, it's almost like their mouths fall open. They ask questions like, has management signed off on this? Do they understand this? The whole thing has started from a vision that I had and some ideas, and my wife and I putting a couple of things together and getting a couple of clients, and now it, truly a global enterprise. We now have affiliates in four countries, Belgium, the Netherlands, South Africa, and Canada. In the last two years have began to develop the nuclear sector, nuclear generation sector with our uh, director there, and that is going very, very well. She's going to become a master facilitator and then she's going to learn everything about how the whole business works. And then ultimately the idea is she and her husband, the cost, are going to build PPI Asia. So this thing is going global. So now what's happening is we're opening up into uh, transportation and government military sectors. And one of the ones I'm most excited about, which I wanted to get involved with for since we started this thing, is the medical industry. You should know that if you go into a hospital today to have anything substantial done, uh, you've got a one out of four chance of some significant human error being committed on your behalf while you're in there. The statistics are horrible. It's quite honestly, this approach can bring rapid results to the medical industry instantaneously. And I see this thing ultimately having a positive impact on the entire world through the workforce. This is not a process for just safety department, keeping somebody safe. 
This is a human development process that can change your life if you believe it. I look at things differently now. I was uh, in what PPI would call the pool of despair. I was making excuses and not looking at what I could do personally to change the situation. So the proactive accountability the pen and getting out of the pool of despair really personally uh, had a major impact on me in my life. Well, at home I have four kids, so it's, uh, it's, it's very important to set a good example to the children that I'm raising. I've come to the conclusion that I'm having more fun working with the team that uh, I serve because we're not always in the negative uh, arena of uh, problems. It uh, gave me a new perspective. It uh, has a profound effect of me being there when I'm with my family, with my grandkids. Uh, I listen to them. Um, I slow down in life and uh, that's a big part. We've got such a electronic world today. We got computers, we got Blackberries, we got iPhones and iPods and everybody's next gonna be needing doctors when you're 45 because nobody ever looks up anymore. And to push that aside when your grandchild walks up and you look at and you get down on your knee. You know what I mean? You listen. And they appreciate. He's a visionary guy. There's no doubt about it. He has been thinking and dreaming about a lot of these things that he's doing since he was just a kid. When he dreams, he dreams big. I like to tell people I've got the greatest job in the world. I get to do what I love to do, what I always dreamed of doing, and honestly know that I'm making a positive difference in the world. And you want to emulate the things he, he's done and the, thing he's, the things he's kind of bringing across to you. It's a way of life, how you maintain a positive attitude and look for the positive in any adversity and turn it into an opportunity to uh, improve. The behaviors that you want to end up with. Look what it can do if it saves one life. If it keeps you from destroying a million dollar piece of equipment, the payback is exponential. It's helped us immensely, not only with the safety aspect of it, but bringing us together as working families. It, it brought every crew out there that's got more of a, a core to it now. They, they care for each other. The end result is making a difference in someone's life. That's what I do this for. It's not the money. It's that I know every day that I come to work, I can make in some way, shape, or form a difference in someone's life. When people ask me what I do, you know, on airplanes and traveling and all this stuff, and I, I basically respond, if we help organizations reduce human error, and without exception, whoever I'm talking to says, boy, we could sure use that in our company. It doesn't matter what the size of the organization is, doesn't matter what industry you're in, anybody can implement this approach because it taps into basic human nature. Any organization that has humans in it, this is gonna work.